So today I'm joined by Geraldine Brigg, who is the CEO of AnytownUSA.com. Welcome. Hi, thanks for having me. All right, so on your website, AnytownUSA.com, you sell everything from clothing, accessories, jewelry, things even for pets. So I guess the premise of the business is that kind of one of a kind handmade items made in the US. Uh, so if you could talk about the genesis of the, the organization and your focus and your specialty. Yeah, sure. Um, well, we are about handmade and manufactured items made in the US, but you have to be made in the US and you have to be compliant with the FTC guidelines for made in US. So um, the genesis of the idea, honestly, and this is a true story, I was president of Clark Shoes. I was sitting in my office one day and it was the week, if you remember, that um, Beyonce's sister beat up Jay-Z in the elevator. And that was all getting covered on the press in the US, but what was going on in Asia, specifically Vietnam, was all of my factories burnt to the ground in a riot. Mm. And it seemed like a good time to think about making product in the US. So that was my sort of light bulb moment. I started investigating, did anybody have a platform to make USA made products? And um, how hard was it to shop and buy for them? And I found that nobody was doing it, that less than 5% of products that we buy today are made in the US, and that people, 78% um, of people would like to buy them, they just can't find them. And that's when I um, you know, pretty much left Clark's and went to work building this website. So this is uh, quite interesting. So at the time of this recording, it's early April. Uh, many of us are quarantined. And one of the things that I think we're starting to recognize is that uh, unless you're ordering food or, or medicine, uh, things are becoming delayed because it's getting manufactured abroad, and particularly China or Southeast Asia. And of course, that supply chain logistics to the end destination is becoming more problematic. Uh, as well as just the sense of loss of control around supplies, whether it's masks or uh, you know ventilators or things that's critical for for addressing the current crisis. How does yeah. this type of experience on this scale help us to rethink about kind of a national strategy around local manufacturing or what we call micro micro factories? Well, it's a good question, and um, I will tell you that when I started this business, a lot of my friends said, what happened to you? I thought you were global. And I said, I am global. I just don't think global means 100% of goods should be made in one place, and meaning, you know, essentially China. And I think everyone is finding that out right now because, as you said, whether it's masks or ventilators, um, it's all delayed because um, it's coming from, you know, pretty much Asia. And so I think the idea is um, an old one and a good one, which is don't put all your eggs in one basket, spread it around a little bit. And really what's going on in this particular moment, you know, on my business is a lot of my makers uh, who are all made in the U.S., uh, we have people in 41 states, um, you know, their businesses are devastated because besides selling on Anytown USA, they also sell to bricks and mortar and they sell at craft and trade shows. And so they're trying to keep their people employed. Um, and so what they've done is they're redeploying a lot of them to make things that people need right now, like hand sanitizer mm -hmm. or masks or things like that. And I think that just highlights the whole thing, which is it's good to have sources and people making, you know, close to home uh, in general for fast turnaround and certainly in crises like this. Yeah, I'm going to actually bring up a couple of points. One is historical and one is kind of forward looking. Historically, if you look at um, the eras of World War I and World War II, there are specifically uh, federal policies that can be enacted to convert private sector manufacturing capacity for the needs of, you know, meeting the needs of uh, the military requirements, whether it's artillery, heavy tanks, uh, vessels, and so forth. So having that capacity is important, not only from a uh, uh, private sector and commerce perspective, but the capacity that's needed to actually defend our country, uh, which is which is an interesting notion, right? Uh, because if you don't, if you can't do that, then you can't make enough planes and and ways to defend our country. So that that's more of a historical context. Looking forward, uh, because I cover smart cities and sustainable cities, is that more and more as we get into kind of mega cities and larger cities. Uh, Yes, there is going to be always that globalization to an extent around e-commerce and the mm -hmm. notion of comparative advantage that takes advantage of 
what the relative uh, competencies are in those different regions, is that more and more we're going to start to have more micro manufacturing locally, especially with the you know with technologies such as three D printing, uh, lab created meat, poultry, and so forth. Is that you can in fact have in you know, an urban setting micro manufacturing capacity that that you didn't have before. And the side benefit of, the, of that, of course, is you know every time you reduce the shipping, the cargo container, of, yep. you know, in terms of ships, planes, and other modes of transportation, train and 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 trucks, is that you are saving a tremendous amount of greenhouse emissions and and carbon footprint. So there is a lot of um, you know good reasoning as to why it makes sense to have some aspects of things to produce locally. My sure. follow-up question. And, yes, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, and um, we have everybody, you know, working with us from, you know, handmakers who are turning out one-of-a-kind specialty things all the way up through small and medium businesses who are manufacturing here in the U.S. And But what they all have in common is they're out there in, um, you know, often rural economies and um, sourcing rurally and keeping people employed locally. Um, and also what they have in common is their products are pretty unique, as in, um, I would say about 80% of our portfolio is not carried on sites like Amazon or Etsy, or the, you know, Amazon has 600 million items, Etsy has 60 million items. So you can actually get um, everyday things like socks on our site that you won't find somewhere else and are made in the U.S. Um, it's funny. Um, about 60% of our buyers are 45 plus and they're concerned about quality and economy and keeping jobs here and keeping um, what I would describe as skills and trades here. But to your point, um, about 40% of our users are millennials and younger and they're into the sustainability, low carbon footprint of uh, local manufacturing and into wearing things that are unique and, um, and carrying things and decorating their homes with things that are unique. And um, they're also powering up the purchases on our site. And I think it all goes back to this whole trend starts with when people started doing farm to table and it started in agriculture. And I think now it's spreading to, um, you know, hard goods and soft goods. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's a, there's a point that you made that's kind of interesting. I just want to elaborate is that, you know, when we think about um, things that we purchase at Target, Walmart, Amazon, and other places is that they're produced using a paradigm of mass production, which means that in order for the cost economic structure to work, they have to drive down the manufacturing cost so that the marginal cost is lowest as possible. Mm -hmm. But the side, side disadvantage of that is that you basically have kind of a homogeneous set of product that's right. that gets distributed across the globe regardless of the local and cultural tastes and preferences. What you're talking about in terms of your product portfolio and your sourcing sellers is that there's a uniqueness that is kind of geographically and culturally uh, embedded to where they are actually residing and, and sourcing their raw materials from. And that's a, that's a flavor of kind of local manufacturing that's a very important piece is that, you know, if I purchase a tea set or a coffee, coffee you know, mug or whatever it is, my preference versus those that are in Italy are going to be very different as an example. That's true. So tuning for those subtleties, those cultural nuances becomes hypercritical for adoption uh, as well as, you know, the circular economy and, and of course, the employment back to those that are producing it. Tell us about, uh, and then you started to kind of get into the sellers, but give us a little bit of sense of who are they? Is this their primary business? How big are these, uh, these companies? I know you mentioned most of them are small, but there are some uh, midsize as well. Sure. I mean, let me start with one of my favorite midsize sellers. Um, Sarah Irvani down in Buford, Georgia is a studio made here in the U.S. And um, to stay in business all this time, um, they have increasingly figured out how to um, keep their costs down. And they did that by making um, a, a closed loop. So they use all their scraps recycled. Um, about 25% of her product is uh, reused. Um, and then they also use soy. So um, they are price comparable, actually, on really high quality, supportive flip-flops and sandals to brands like Vionic or Clark's. Um, and, but they're also sustainable. And she has a great business and has sold like 35 million pairs of shoes. But then um, you also jump out to Wisconsin, where people like um, 
Jim Martin at uh, Green3 is taking dead stock from, um, which is uh, unused material from the apparel industry, which is a huge problem, and reconditioning it and repurposing it into amazing sweaters and gloves and shirts and things like that. And Jim used to work at Oshkosh Bagash, but now this is his passion. And he is manufacturing all sorts of apparel every day, and he's a top seller on our site. But then we also have people like, look, my first seller was our college room, my college roommate. And she is an artist, and she makes something called Nuno Felted Scarves, one at a time, each individual, hand-dyed, hand-sewn. And um, she's also on the site. So, um, look, our goal is to be able to dress you from head to toe and your house from front to back door. So we are looking at regular um, consumable categories. And anybody who manufactures, like I said, in the U.S. or hand makes in the U.S. Um, compliant with FTC guidelines is welcome on the site. Let me give you an example. Um, the, last, uh, the last step in manufacturing of an item has to be substantially completed in the U.S. to count as made in U.S. So if you're importing a t-shirt from Bangladesh and then you do a beautiful silk screen on it, you don't qualify um, because it started life as a t-shirt and it's still a t-shirt. But if you cut and sew that t-shirt in the U.S. and then silk screen it, you're good to go. Families are having challenges. You know, the kids are home. The parents are trying to work remotely. Um, so what are some products that's selling well that you know, makes sense for this time period of being quarantined. Yep. So let, let's do the, um, the critical first. Um, a lot of our sellers of beauty products have converted to making hand sanitizer and we're selling that. And if you're, um, you know, you're home yourself with your family, somebody has to go out and get the groceries or go to the doctor or something. You need to be using that hand sanitizer. Um, and, since everybody's washing their hands more often right now, I, it might as well be fun. And a lot of our sellers are making really cute soaps, either really luxury to use or like shaped like little bunnies or like those peep um, treats for Easter. So um, that's one thing. And also um, uh, some of our clothing and baby clothing manufacturers have started making those personal masks that you can wear when you go out to keep you from touching your face or coughing on someone. So that's the basics. But what people are doing at home um, I can't tell you how many puzzles, thousand piece puzzles are flying out our door. I mean, and we have a wonderful vendor that is uh, making them right here in the U.S. And um, it's everything from beach scenes to Christmas scenes, and they are moving really fast. But we also have a lot of DIY kits. Um, we have, you know, for children, make your own bracelet. Um, one of my favorites is a little t-shirt that has, uh, do you know what blackboard paint is? It, okay, so blackboard paint sort of on a t-shirt and the kids can decorate their own t-shirt or decorate their own scarf or things like that. So lots of, um, you know, smart craft things, lots of puzzles and games, uh, all sorts of things like that. And then, of course, the essentials for, um, you know, helping to ensure your health a little bit. All right. So whether you're into uh, sustainability or whether you're into supporting American made products, how can people find out more about your products across the different categories? Yeah. So um, they should come to anytownusa.com. That's our website. And of course they should look through, I mean, we have 10,000 products. We don't have 60 million, like uh, it's easier to sort through. Uh, we also jury our site, by the way. Um, just anybody can't get up on the site. We have a process where we review, so we keep out um, things that are not FTC compliant and not um, high quality. But get through the products. But also, if you click down to the bottom of the page, you will see our media center. And in there, we have recorded 50 podcasts, and each one tells a different seller's story. And our podcast is called The American Made Marketplace, and we drop one every Friday. Um, right now, as a matter of fact, we have four waiting in the can to be edited for people to listen to. And um, each seller tells a story and you can learn how they enter business. And, you know, a friend of mine who has small kids said to me the other day, she really does her child to believe that things, um, you know, begin life in a breath. That it's really important people know that there's people standing behind everything we make and eat and use. So she doesn't want her children to believe that every thing emerges uh, fully formed out of a brown box. And I think one way to do that is listen to our podcasts and hear the sellers talk about their craft and their skill and where they're making it and how they're making it. A lot of these people learn their craft or trade from their parents or an uncle or somebody important in their life. 
and they'll tell you how things are made. And, um, and it's not a lecture. We have a lot of fun and um, laugh on these podcasts, and we even play a little game. So that's one way to find out about, you know, everything from painted floor mats to um, apparel to jewelry to beauty products. Um, 50 stories recorded right there for you. All right. Well, I want to wish you and your uh, family and your colleagues safety during this time. And today I've been joined by Geraldine Briggs, who is the CEO of AnyTownUSA.com.